some of the event events. And, uh, Brian again wants to get into the talk and says, I believe I, 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 I find, and Andy goes on and says, I find one should in this common world where we all live, in which we are all endowed with material goods, so unequally, we should at least in a small scale try to produce no waste, no useless waste. And uh, Ali, Brian, uh, and I'm not, I don't believe, tries to get in, and Ali again says, no ways to produce and always in our consciousness to think that we in the rich Western world and it goes on and on and on and on. Okay? So if we think back to this model, we can say that on the conceptual level, there are completely different knowledge sets about how to behave at a little dinner party, what to do there, what to say, how to engage in a conversation. You can also say, uh, that there is a different interactional goal. The goal by this American speaker was to engage in the light small talk, which one does apparently in many cultures. Not so much in the German culture, I think you can believe me that this is true. And then there is an immediate switch from these conceptual boxes to uh, to, the, to a box of realizing language. In other words, the input, if you remember the, uh, the, the little model, the input is completely ignored. If you look at this transcript again, for instance, the first remarkable thing that happens, usually when you ask somebody, I don't know about your culture, but people do this as well, if somebody asks you, how are you, and you say, fine, you reciprocate, you say, and how are you? Okay, people mostly do this because you shouldn't be so selfish in talking about yourself all the time. This is not a convention in, uh, in the German culture. So this leads to the first misunderstanding. But the real misunderstanding, this is the whole event, starts in, in line six. When Brian says that's what we eat in the South, this can be classified as a remark, a harmless remark. And what would be expected of our body, because in the South are interested, we eat or something like that. Totally in A remarks about something, but this does not happen. Okay. And again, the discourse strategy that we have called expander. The Andy, why would we expand on what he says? He goes on and on about the ways and so on. He does not notice what happens. Interesting is after the, uh, the, the transcription was made, I interviewed the two people, and there was a lack of awareness on the part of the German speaker that he had actually insulted the other one, that the other one couldn't get a word in actions. Okay, he just said, oh, it was interesting, we had a good talk, we talked about the problems of the so-called developing world, whatever, but uh, Brian said he was very disappointed, he had liked this German friend, he had helped him, but he felt talked down like a teacher, and he, he was totally dissatisfied. But that is a, a, a misunderstanding. Okay. Now I um, have looked at differences in the two cultures, the Anglophone cultures, by which I linked together all the uh, Anglophone cultures, the American, British, Australian, and so on, and the German culture, and comparing many different texts and discourses over many years and came up with the generalizations that you can see on this slide that uh, Ger the Germans are on the uh, left hand side, the left, yes, they tend to be more direct. They say things the way they are. They don't dance around politely as many other speakers do. They're more oriented towards self. This you can pinpoint by the discourse strategies they use. And they're already towards the content. It's important what is said, not how. And they are more explicit. They overlap all of these. When you look at this, you can see, I don't know what, what you know about Germans, but there's a certain prejudice. There's always prejudice about certain cultures. And this actually fits the prejudice in a certain way. It doesn't really matter. I said this yesterday. Prejudices always have a little bit of the grain of truth in them. Sad as they are. Okay? Another uh, explanatory hypothesis is uh, if you look at the literature of philosophical speech act studies, for instance by Paul Rice, 
he said, famously set up four maxims that underlie all communication. The maxim of quality, people should tell the truth. The maxim of quality, you shouldn't say more than is necessary. The maxim of relation or relevance, you should only say what is relevant at any moment of time. And you should be brief. Okay? This, it, it, this is the idea of people obviously don't behave like this. But there seems to be, looking at this model, there seems to be divergent interpretations by Germans and Anglican speakers. Germans talk more, often it is not relevant, and they do not very brief. Okay? Also, we can explain the difference by looking at Robin Maycock's uh, politeness principles. She talks about a person is polite when he or she don't impose his own ways on somebody else, when the speaker gives options to the hearer, okay, and when the speaker makes the hearer feel good. Now, I don't have to explain to you what went wrong in this little example. These uh, politeness principles, at least the give options and the makes the hearer feel good, were flouted. Okay? There are other um, explanatory hypotheses that, is, that are necessary to follow if you compare two cultures, and unfortunately there are very, very few cultural comparisons that can be taken seriously if we abstract from the uh, rather ridiculously general uh, work by Hochschede, you probably know this, from the you compare the IBM uh, people in very different cultures, these are far too general. But if you look at uh, different societies in terms of the context of their history, the, the philosophical development, the social political development, the relation of the forms in a certain culture, the legal and the educational system, all this impacts on the way people behave. So what you have just seen, there is, seems to be a deep-seated difference in the German educational tra um, the tradition that I first went through, there it is more important to transmit the content rather than what I have called the Anglo-American etiquette of simulation. You know this in when you ask people how are you and people pretend to be interested in how you are and you are supposed to, to also pretend that you are interested in so on. This is, is pretense but it lubricates social interaction. Then there is a difference in the legal system. There is an interesting article by Pierre Legrand who claims that the legal systems in the cultures will never converge. There is a fixed constitution. Now, most of the European countries, other than England, other than the United States, work with the law of precedent, where there is room for negotiation. And that, of course, has an impact. You know, from the, from the TV stories that you know, celebrate the, the Jews or the Jews. And, of course, there are ideologies that are passed down through the century. Okay. Now let me come to my next to last point. What happens when everybody speaks English the way we do now? For many of you in this auditorium, English is not your native tongue, nor is it the native tongue of myself. So English, of course, you know this is the most important means of uh, communication, the default means actually. It's the global lingua franca, tendency rising, ever more people will speak English. I've been to Iran uh, lately and to China on the lecture tools and most of the people know in this good language. English is used in important areas, business, science, cultural events, tourism. So given the fact that English is spoken by people who come from vastly different cultural backgrounds, one would assume that lots and lots of misunderstandings of the type I described would occur, wouldn't it, right? But this is not the case, as we found out. There's a little research uh, project that I have been conducting in Hamburg. Again, I taped uh, group talk interaction, in, interactions, for interactions, all speaking in English, coming from Korea, from China, from Japan, from uh, Czechoslovakia, and so on. And we have done a number of analysis, and they basically show the following results. Surprisingly, there is a total lack of misunderstandings. It really is surprising. Why do people not misunderstand one another? People adopt 
again, as you can see on this slide, the so-called let it pass principle. Alan Firth, who worked uh, on Denmark and is now in Newcastle, has, has said that this let it pass principle uh, is actually underlying most of this talk, which means if people don't understand, they patiently wait and think, oh, I'll find out later. Okay? okay. So these, the speakers of English as a lingua franca go out of their way not to let misunderstandings happen because they are aware of the precarious nature of this multicultural talk. They know this. They, they adapt. They try to normalize potential trouble sources. Whenever they feel that something is imminent, imminent they uh, uh, help one another out. They, what they do, for instance, they use what uh, I have called a represent which means they just repeat what another person has said in order to gain time, to create coherence, and they use it as a meta-communicative procedure. This type of uh, re repetition, as you can see here, by, is very easy. The Chinese speaker, in a way, says, is easy, is very easy. He doesn't say it because he's too stupid to, to follow the first time, but he uses this to gain time. And this type of thing happens in teaching, in instruction, and it happens in air traffic control talk, because it's very dangerous if people don't understand, a plane will crash, crash, sorry, crash. Okay? Another little uh, example, the, um, the gambit of this cosmarker you know, that you all know from American talk shows, where teenagers use this a lot, they speak the same life that you know the whole time. In this English as a lingua franca talk, that you know is also used very frequently. It may annoy you to if I, I would go from to read this out to you, but it is used here strategically. Yeah? From what again I interview people, it's again used to gain time, to structure one's own uh, discourse. Okay? Third point one can make is that when people notice that another person is unable to somehow finish what he or she said, they all chip in and collaborate or scaffold or hold the start. Here we have again the Chinese speaker who says, because the history of this development of language in the very early period, and then he has a very long pause. Three seconds is very long. Everybody will fidget if I pause for three seconds. So the Korean speaker, Joy, says, build up the basis, helping him. And he says, yes. To be a world language, she says yes, yeah. and he says yes. So they master this trouble source by joining their forces. Okay. Now I'm coming to my last few remarks. What can one actually do to promote intercultural competence in speakers and to counteract communication failures? I have suggested some years ago that it is important to increase people's pragmatic fluency, which means they are fluent in what they say, they are fluent in politeness strategies, they are fluent in mastering obstacles and, and, and gaps in their knowledge. They, it is important to reveal and counteract what one can call strategic misunderstanding and manipulative practices of deceitful talk. This is very important to get people to understand that much of the misunderstanding is deliberately produced, and this should be revealed. Just as intentionally conflicted, confrontational talk that we know from politics, that should be unmasked and avoided. Okay? The three other points, or four other points, to avoid misunderstanding, I said this before, meaning in talk is never laid out clean and neat, it must be inferred. But inferences that people make in their ways, in their minds, are quick and automatic in spoken discourse. People just don't have the time. And thus often result in misunderstanding. To minimize these is to just slow down. We have to have an open mind, a revision mentality, by which I mean you have to revise your early interpretations and uh, ascriptions of intentions for people because they may be quite different in the end. This is what is meant by an open mind. You don't have to make snap judgments. 
you, you have to be willing to delay your interpretation as long as possible. So as to avoid premature judging or prejudice. Prejudice is premature judging. And we have to increase awareness of our own and others' intentions and needs by listening properly and not shutting off the input the way I showed you in, uh, in, in this uh, misunderstanding.